although nominally we're looking back at the whole of 2023, I've chosen just to hone in on Israel at war because this is the very current thing that's taking place before our eyes. And there are so many mysteries. You know, what, what is it all about? How is it going to end? How does it fit in with Bible prophecy? So what we're going to concentrate on is uh, this time of uh, warfare for Israel and what scripture guides us will be its outcome. We're not particularly concerned about the individual details of what happens, so we'll just look at a little bit of that. But we want to get the background of why Hamas chose now to strike Israel and why Israel needs this wake up call and for ourselves this is a big wake up call because we know this isn't the final judgment this isn't go coming down against israel on the mountains of israel um, but this is a precursor this is a way that god is using to push his people back to uh, recognizing that they are a special people they are god's people in preparation for that greater tragedy which is going to unfold upon them when Gog sweeps down and destroys them. And so what we want to look at is just how all this uh, fits in and how we can possibly, because we know there still has to be a time of peace and safety. Ezekiel 38 is specifically clear about that. And Ezekiel 39, God makes it clear, yes, this is going to happen. It's going to happen not because of my blessing. It's going to be actually a time of trespass in my eyes. But there has to be a time of peace and safety for Israel prior to the nations uh, coming down against Israel. Uh, and what we're seeing out of the outcome of this terrible situation at the moment, I'm sure, is going to be uh, a situation where Israel works with the Arab nations and brings peace and stability to the region for a short period of time. Uh, um, we know that uh, long before God comes down into the land of Israel, we're going to be called away to judgment. So let's just try and make sense of what happened on that fateful Sabbath day on October the 7th. So what happened on that special day? It was a day when Jews and Israel and around the world uh, would gather together because it was a special Shabbat. It was known as Shimchat Torah. And this particular Sabbath marks the ending of the Feast of Sukkoth, the Feast of Tabernacle celebrations. So this is the last day of Sukkoth when they've been thanking God for all the blessings of the harvest of, that's been gathered in, and they begin to turn to look to what is going to happen in a new agricultural year that was just dawning, and they will be ploughing and sowing and planting the crops for the next year. But the point about this special Sabbath was it also marked the end of the Jews' uh, reading calendar, they came to the end of the Torah, to Deuteronomy chapter 34, uh, read of the death of Moses and the appointment of Joshua to lead the people in. Uh, and then they also, on that same day, uh, read from Genesis chapter 1 about God, the great creator, who has all things under his control. He brought everything into being. He is the all-powerful God. And so, in, in a sense, this this special Shabbat uh, marks the end of one period and the beginning of a new period. And Jews around the world, as I say, would celebrate. Those that didn't often go to the synagogues would go along to the synagogue on this particular Sabbath day. And so this Simchat Torah is uh, has the meaning of rejoicing with the Torah, with the law, or the rejoicing of the Torah. And so it was quite appropriate for what unfolded. So it was on this particular most solemn day for the Jews 
that their enemies struck hard and totally unexpectedly. And at 6.30 in the morning, the first of 5,000 rockets were launched at various towns in Israel. And it was the air raid sirens that alerted those Jews living away from the border that there was something greatly amiss. And in the first few minutes, uh, using paragliders and uh, um, power gliders, uh, Hamas terrorists sailed over the fence into the many settlements that surrounded the um, Gaza border. And uh, they also used uh, drones which had got uh, ammunition on to knock out the surveillance cameras and the electricity substations so that pictures of what they were doing uh, weren't circulated. It was a very sophisticated operation. And by the end of the day, there were 30 breaches made in the fence. The blue shaded areas on the map show the many secular kibbutz which were there, which were uh, invaded. 2,500 Hamas terrorists, each armed with a detailed map of a particular destination, a particular kibbutz, uh, and where they were to attack. And the orders were to kill as many Jews as they could and take others prisoners. And the red dotted line on the map shows the furthest penetration that was made in those early hours. And as we know, over 1,200 Jews were brutally killed. Um, it's uh, absolutely barbaric what was practiced on these civilian victims by Hamas. It's beyond imagination. And it has emerged that the death toll would have been far greater if it hadn't been for the initiative of many of the reservists who wouldn't normally uh, look at their phones, cell phones, uh, on this special Shabbat. But hearing the sirens go, they were quickly in touch with each other and news got out of the dreadful invasion that was taking place. And without waiting for the military to call them up, they jumped in their cars with their uh, guns uh, and went. And as I say, without that intervention by reservists, um, it, the slaughter would have been far greater. As it was, it took uh, quite a time to uh, overcome. And the army itself, it wasn't until five hours after the initial invasion that uh, Nadnahu announced to the nation that we are at war, uh, not an operation, not a round of fighting, we are at war, and call-up of 300,000 uh, Israelis, the biggest call-up since the Yom Kippur War of 50 years previously. And in fact, such was the spirit that uh, a lot of uh, older reservists who weren't due to be called up because of their age they too joined, and so a total of 3, 360,000 Israelis left their homes, their jobs, their, whatever they were doing, uh, to um, defend their country uh, against this violent attack. And it wasn't until Tuesday, so that was the Shabbat, the Saturday, it wasn't until Tuesday till all the terrorists were cleared out. About 1,500 were killed. And since then, Israel has been busy attacking Hamas. In the past, Israel's policy has been, as far as Hamas is concerned, that they mowed the grass, which is, you know, a very expressive <laughs> expression. Um, the idea was to knock Hamas back so that they were quiet for a few years, knowing that few years or months down the line, they would rebuild themselves and attack Israel again, and that would have to be, the grass would have to be mowed again. But this time was different. Let's say this was the biggest one day um, death toll of Jews since the Holocaust. 
So this was a step too far. The Hamas had gone far too far for Israel just to do the usual mowing of the grass. And Netanyahu determined that this time Hamas had to be eliminated. One of the difficulties, of course, is that the Gaza Strip is very highly populated, packed houses, and it was known to Israel that Hamas had all these underground tunnels where they lived and had their headquarters and stored their arms, where they took the hostages, and they were very much sighted underneath schools, mosques, um, hospitals. Hamas has no respect of life. The more deaths there are, then the greater it feeds their cause. So it, it was a very difficult decision for Israel to make, but they had to root out and they knew it would result in a lot of deaths on the Israeli soldiers' point of view. I just want to pick out one event because this is so typical of what Israel has had to face was that incident on day 11 when in the evening came the news that Israel had destroyed this hospital. Uh, film cameras showed uh, rescuers uh, bearing stretches of dead bodies, piling them up, showing the complete um, devastation that Israel had caused through bombing a hospital. And Hamas put out the figure that 500 people had been killed uh, that evening. And we know when morning came that, of course, there was a completely different picture. The hospital buildings, they were all standing. Virtually all the tiles are on the roof. You can just see a few broken ones. It, it was uh, some explosive fire in the car park. So this clearly wasn't an Israeli bomb because when Israel drops a bomb, there's a big crater and it was admitted by um, Hamas that uh, this was one of their rockets. About one in 15 falls short, never reaches the border and causes devastation. And the true death figure was put at about 40, not 500, but that figure of 500 was paraded around the world. And we know what a, an effect that has had and that has sparked with all the um, demonstrations which are still ongoing in London and Tokyo and America, Australia, all around the world, of this uh, protest at the brutality of uh, Israel. And what we have to remember is that Hamas controls everything. She is, you know, in charge of the government and uh, all the figures are put out by the Gazan Health Ministry, which is Hamas. And as I say, it is their interest to exaggerate the figures. Um, and the figures just don't stack up if you look at them intently. Um, and of course, they make no distinction between their own rockets, which fall and kill people, um, compared with Israeli ones. And they don't count their own Hamas casualties because they're not a regular army and therefore are all classed as civilians. And we get this figure of, you know, so many uh, children being killed. Well, it's just one of those facts that because of the population of Gaza, 50% uh, of the population in Gaza are 18 or under. It's one of those statistics. And what we have to remember is that from the age of 13, Hamas trains the young boys, especially uh, in summer camps, to fight, use weapons, uh, to become martyrs. Their parents are encouraged to martyr their children. Um, and so it's not surprising that a lot of children have been killed, majority of whom would be um youngsters aged 14, 15, up to 18, who have died because they were fighting with Hamas. So the, the great problem for Israel are all the 
underground tunnels, and they've now discovered that there are far more tunnels than they thought. Um, it is said that the tunnel system is greater than the New York Metro and the London Underground. Some of them are wide enough for cars to drive in deep underground, and all of them coming up into civilian places like hospitals and mosques and private houses, which means when Israel is trying to um, chase the terrorists in these tunnels, they face the danger that the terrorists have many escape routes uh, and many booby traps are set. And so it is a very difficult task that lies for them. And so they develop various techniques. They have these sponge bombs, which uh, consist of two chemicals, which they drop into the tunnel and they mix together and form an impenetrable foam, which uh, blocks off the tunnel. And they also have these robots, which they can put down the tunnel to with cameras so that they can detect the booby traps. And they also have um, dogs, which are trained to go down these tunnels. But it, it is not easy, and many of the soldiers, especially recently with the pressure from the world to prevent all these uh, civilian casualties, has resulted in many more Jewish soldiers being killed than would have been necessary if it wasn't for that pressure. And you know, Israel is faced with this heavy propaganda which uh, Hamas uh, pumps out, which is lapped up by New York Times, BBC, Sky News, Washington Post, Guardian, and just repeated as if a uh, gospel of truth. So I want us now to step back and see why Hamas chose this particular time to begin this battle. And we have to think of what's been happening in Israel during the past 12 months. And night after night, there have been demonstrations, big gatherings in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, and other major cities uh, in Israel of people demonstrating um, about the reforms which Netanyahu is determined to push through Parliament. And as a result of Israel being so tied up with all these demonstrations, it has certainly weakened the preparedness uh, for this, uh, what was to unfold. Uh, in spite of many warnings that something, Hamas was uh, planning something, the leaders were so taken up with these uh, protests against the reforms that uh, they ignored all the warning signs. The protests have been about the desire to reform the Supreme Court. Now, the Israeli Supreme Court is different from those in this country, in Australia, in America, Canada, in that the government doesn't appoint the judges on to the Supreme Court. They appoint their own judges. And the Supreme Court is very left wing. Um, and so let's just explore, because this is fundamental to understanding the whole situation in Israel at the moment. What's so important about left-wing, right-wing divide in Israel? Well, in very, very simple terms, it is that the left-wing wants Israel to be a secular state, whereas the right-wing says, no, Israel is a special state. It is for the benefit of Jews. And if we want to shut the railways on Shabbat, well, they will be shut. Uh, and, and so we have this uh, grouping between the left wing and the right wing. And it has been the left wing who have been organising oops, sorry, uh, these uh, demonstrations. They've been very well organised. Um, the... Um, Organisers have used buses to bring people in, have given them Israeli flags to fly and had all these huge Israeli flags. Um, and what, what they're protesting about uh, 
is the reforms that Netanyahu needs to make. Because in the past, the government has been centre or left wing. And so having a left wing Supreme Court wasn't too bad because the kind of laws being passed they approved of. Now we've got a right wing government uh, with religious parties in who are wanting to make reforms. Well, the Supreme Court has the power to block any legislation that the government makes and passes. And that's the government that was elected by the Israeli people. Uh, they can stop any legislation that they don't like. And they don't like Netanyahu. They don't like a right-wing government. Um, the thought to, to the left wing, the thought that Israel is a, a, a Jewish country run for the benefit of the Jews is actually anathema to these people. Interesting quote here. The entire left wing of Israel is genuinely fearful of a state of Israel that is run by religious Jews and right-wing Jews that the left see as backward and non-progressive. But the fact of the matter is that there are more than 65% of Israeli Jews are opposed to progressive left-wing values and support a more traditional or religious lifestyle. The protesters don't care as much about democracy as they care about losing power. They support a secular, non-Jewish country and are willing to be violent and fight their own brethren in order not to lose control. The reigning right wing is largely traditional or religious, respects the rights of others and will never cut off their connections with their brethren. So you've got this big difference between left wing and right wing. And also the... Um, Statistics are quite interesting. Um, this is by Melanie Phillips, who's always worth listening to. She's a panelist um, and also writes many articles. And it says, she said, there can surely be no compromise with the organisers of the anti-reform protests, because for them, the real issue was never the prime minister, was never the reform itself, sorry, as was stated explicitly from the start by former Prime Minister Yair Lapid and others. The aim was to bring down Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government. One of the main leaders of the protests is another former Prime Minister, Ehud Barak. An astounding video clip has now surfaced showing Barak in March 2020 addressing a group of retired Israeli Air Force pilots and navigators. Three years before the judicial reform was even a twinkle in the Israeli government's eyes, Barak detailed for this group a plan for a coup d'etat that would overturn the Netanyahu government and install Barak himself as prime minister. The plan involved inciting the civilian population to revolt by bankrolling protests that would manipulate popular patriotism by such measures as the mass purchase of Israeli flags. And that's uh, exactly the technique that they've used. They claim that democracy was in danger, uh, used a lot of American Jews' money to bankroll all these protests. But it gets worse than that because uh, the very military itself uh, were compromised. And this is an interesting article. There's a Spaniard who, uh, through his job, uh, used to go to Israel every time there had been a battle with Hamas to uh, interrogate the Jews and find out, you know, the strong points and the weak points in their battles against Hamas. And he was saying that the, the way the army has been penetrated by this... Um, what he calls westernization of the Israeli people. By westernization, I mean its latest cultural manifestation, the woke mentality. We all know what the woke mentality is about. And so back in 2021, which was his last visit, uh, he sat in on all these uh, Israeli presentations from the military 
on their perceived threats. And the first item to be discussed in the threat arena was climate change. And why ever consider that climate change should be the number one concern? And he went on to say that um, from his humble point of view, as far as I know, um, Israel, the unpreparedness for this attack, as he wrote this after October the 7th, was rooted in the accelerated westernization. Um, sorry, well, um, that's what we looked at, yeah. Uh, and so he and his good friend Richard Kemp, who was again a British writer, very well, uh, good to listen to, wrote an article back in February after seeing the opposition's almost unhealthy degree of animosity to the current coalition government, using the government's proposed judicial reform as a battering ram to completely delegitimize it. Calls such as those for former Prime Minister Ehud Barak for insurrection or the refusal of reservists and to join their units seem to us highly dangerous because they could lead Israel's enemies to believe that their internal division was making them weaker. And that indeed was the case. Hamas could see how weak the uh, army leaders were. And so they um, Hamas were very encouraged. They saw Israel divided, all these government protests. They saw the army full of these strange woke ideas um, not concentrating on the job in hand. And so they saw the opportunity, and this was something that they had been looking at for about uh, two years, um, to plan an attack. But what really triggered it um, was the concern that Russia and Iran had over Israel's progress in making peace talks with Saudi Arabia. They could see if that was successful and it looked as if it was going to turn out to be very successful, then that would put paid to all their plans of having their domination in the Middle East because uh, with the moderate Arab nations working with Israel would be a power far stronger than anything that Iran could deal with. And because of Biden's uh, drive to uh, revive this nuclear accord, uh, he had given them a lot of cash. Um, there was that prisoner swap earlier in the year where he'd given them $6 billion. That has now been frozen, but they'd also had uh, $90 billion from the oil sanctions when they were lifted. So Iran had lots of money. And Iran was using this money uh, through her proxies to um, deal a blow with Israel's plans to make peace with Saudi Arabia and the other nations. Uh, and Biden seemed so weak to the Iranians. He kept on allowing them to do all sorts of things without uh, fighting back. Uh, and they perceived that he was a very weak man. And so they started their planning, as I say, it uh, started uh, two years before, but um, this accelerated things. And uh, last month, Iran was free to purchase arms from anywhere. Um, the embargo on Iran was lifted by America. Uh, it was interesting that the UK and France and Germany didn't lift their embargoes, but Iran was very encouraged by everything that had happened. Uh, and we know that Iran was behind it all. It was such a sophisticated attack. It, it couldn't have happened uh, without help from Iran. And we know how uh, the leaders from Hamas and Hezbollah were frequent visitors to plan these things out um, with Iran. Iran is the big sponsor uh, of all these troubles. She sponsors the Houthis in Yemen. Um, 
causes a lot of trouble in Iraq, where American troops are stationed, causes a lot of problems in Syria, uh, causes a lot of problems in Lebanon through Hezbollah, sponsoring Hezbollah, and also Hamas and Fatah. In fact, uh, it's said that a uh, hundred million dollars has been poured into uh, Hamas since uh, 2012. So uh, Iran itself um, is waiting till she has a bomb or two or three um, before she is more active in striking Israel. It's an open secret that Israel has nuclear weapons. And so Iran doesn't feel able to attack because uh, Israel has uh, these fearsome weapons which she would be prepared to use if Iran attacked her. And so instead she chooses to work through these um, terrorist organisations in other countries, fund them uh, and get them to do the dirty work, supplying them with the ammunition and the weaponry that they need uh, and letting them get on with it. Russia too, we know, was involved because the Hamas and Hezbollah uh, went to Russia um, and uh, finalised plans there. And so it was agreed that uh, there would be this time, this battle, um, using Hamas to destroy Israel. And uh, the date was chosen on October the 7th, uh, because they knew they had to act fairly swiftly before Israel had made these agreements with Saudi Arabia. And uh, the date was also the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, which was the last time really when there was a huge battle in Israel and Israel again was caught off guard by the Arab enemies who attacked him. Um, and the Shabbat was chosen because uh, Israel would be deeply involved in other matters at the time. But as well as Russia and uh, Iran, we have to see the hand of the Vatican. This is a report going back to 2014 and the Vatican uh, decided to uh, make public her feelings about the uh, Palestinians and her, that cause. And uh, the Vatican recognised the Palestinians as a state and uh, used her influence. But what, what's been so interesting is for years and years, the Palestinian and the Vatican representatives at the United Nations used to sit side by side. That has now changed because they've had to rearrange the seats because there are more members. But for years, they sat side by side. And knowing the Vatican's hostility to the state of Israel, it, it will be impossible for the Vatican not to have helped the Palestinians on how to cause trouble uh, and make uh, trouble for Israel. And very interestingly, just before October the 7th, at the end of September, uh, Pope Francis elevated about 20 new cardinals. One of them was the um, Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, and uh, he was appointed a cardinal, and uh, along to celebrate that came a, a, a group of uh, Palestinian delegates um, with ecclesiastical and popular delegation from Palestine, Jordan and all parts of the world, including a member of the executive committee of the Palestine Liberation Organization. Now, if you're old enough, you remember Yasser Arafat and the PLO, which uh, was its uh, charter was to eliminate Israel. And interesting comment was uh, put that um, a number of participants to the ceremony 
carry the Palestinian flag, emphasising the importance of the elevated, elevation to cardinal of the Latin patriarch of Rosh Jerusalem in raising the voice of the holy city throughout the world. So the Pope saw this as a wonderful opportunity to um, promote the Palestinian cause, which he has always supported, has always sided with the Palestinians against Israel, because uh, he doesn't like the fact that Israel controls Jerusalem. He feels it should either be a neutral place or should be under Vatican control. And so we can be quite certain that behind the scenes, the Vatican has been playing her work. And we know how the Pope is quite deeply involved with the peace talks and has had telephone calls with the Iranian leaders. So they are involved as well. So as I say, two years in planning and training, uh, Hamas built a mock village in Gaza to represent one of the Israeli kibbutz so that they could practice storming it. Uh, and what they were exploiting was this Israeli woke thinking that Hamas didn't really want conflict. And you might remember back in May time, when the Islamic Jihad fired many thousands of rockets at Israel, that Hamas didn't join in. And that was a deliberate ploy, and they boasted afterwards, you know, how they had deceived Israel into thinking. See, this woke thinking sees good in everybody, and the leaders were under the impression that if we help Hamas, um, give them more work permits, uh, you know, they'll be reasonable. Uh, and they've given up this ideology of exterminating the Jews. So that was the left thinking. And we know what uh, a folly that indeed proved to be. We know that Putin helped to train uh, the Hamas in uh, building these um, drones with weapons on. Um, kamikaze drones so Wagner troops in Africa did the training for that and Hezbollah in Lebanon provided the paragliding training um, for Hamas so it was all well organised and uh, as I say this date was chosen because of its significance from the Yom Kippur War now more and more Jews have seen what is happening here as a, a, a turning point for Israel. Uh, just like 1948, the War of Independence, this is now a second war of uh, independence. And what is emerging is a changed Israel, now much more right wing, seeing God seeing God playing a role in their country, that they are a special people. God has gathered them to their land. And that, yes, it is right that the nation should be run for the benefit of the Jews. And as they say, we've got nowhere else to go. So um, this uh, Avi Abelow is um, a reporter has a news channel and every few days puts up an update. Um, he volunteered to join the um, reservists. He's 50, so he was above the call-up age. Uh, he's got one son in the commandos and another son in the reservists, so he's got his ear to the ground. And he's been, oh, this is uh, in October the 25th, Uh, his update 12, I think, yesterday's was uh, 47. So he continued to give uh, as he can because he's uh, in the reservists. But he just snatches 20 minutes or so just to give a broadcast and give a picture of what's actually happening on the ground, which we don't get from the newspapers. And what he has been saying is that the ordinary Jewish soldiers have no faith in their leaders. This woke spirit has uh, 
proved to be so um, wrong, as it were. But what he had to say on this uh, issue number 12 was quite a remarkable thing, was that on October the 5th, so that's on the Thursday before the uh, Hamas attack on the Saturday, there was a big left-wing gathering in Tel Aviv. And the speaker there said, the war begins on October the 7th. Now, he had no idea that Hamas were going to attack. What he was meaning is that they, the left wing, were going to attack their right wing brothers, fellow Jews, who were showing religious signs and displays, singing and dancing. They were going to go into Tel Aviv, which very left wing city, uh, and break up these demonstrations. Such was their hatred of the right wing. And uh, of course, what if he didn't know but uh, uh, Hamas was going to uh, do the declaration of war? What he didn't realize was that there was a God in Israel who had other plans and October the 7th was to be uh, a very much a judgment against the left wing because the settlements uh, around the Gaza Strip were very much left-wing settlements. Few religious people, and he also told another remarkable story, that when the terrorists came in on October the 7th, as say they had their detailed plans of just where the their houses were, where their safe rooms were, where they kept their ammunition, total detail. And one pair of religious Jews looking out the window saw this terrorist read their number of their house, look at his plan, and then move off. And they were surprised at that. Subsequently, the terrorist got shot, and subsequently the plan got found. And basically it said on it, uh, these are religious people, they're not going to be there on Shabbat, so don't bother. Um, so that was quite a remarkable story. Uh, their lives were saved. So what he is saying is that he has seen a remarkable change in the ordinary people, left and right, and put their differences aside, recognise that these left-wing ideas just didn't work, that this concept that Hamas was a reasonable organization and could be dealt with um, peaceably, um, again, just didn't work. And again, uh, when the settlements were attacked, the left-wing people were absolutely appalled at the brutality of Hamas. And what Avi said, well, I've been saying that for years, but the difference is, in the past, it's been attacks on the so-called West Bank, uh, not on whole villages, but usually on individuals. They centre on the house uh, and brutally murder uh, and in horrible ways, uh, kill the family. And he said, because the left wing say, ah, oh, well, it's all the fault of the settlers. They shouldn't be on the left bank. We should give that back to Hamas and then they'll dwell at peace. It's all been dismissed and not reported on in the main press in Israel. But he said, yes, they've been brutal right from the beginning. So, as I say, he has seen this change uh, in the ordinary people. They're more prepared now to wear a kippur and wear the prayer shawls and go to the synagogue uh, than ever they were before. And these are just small signs. Uh, they're uh, rituals of the Jews, but it, it, it marks a beginning of a change for the nation of Israel to realise that they are a special people, they are God's people, and that they have to uh, show that in their lives.
So this was a, an interesting article, just December the 10th, uh, um, what it turning Israel's heart. Uh, Israel has a phrase, uh, sobering up. And to them, what it means is, ah, uh, I have had my eyes open as to just what who Hamas are, what they are. And uh, this was a, a article in Hebrew, which was uh, translated for the benefit of English readers uh, of this Elias Cohen, who was uh, um, a very um, outspoken um, pacifist, really, uh, lived on the West Bank and extensively wrote, but he was very much against Netanyahu and his, and his uh, reforms. And he says, uh, I have sobered up. The events of Shimtat Dora uh, are an earthquake and a reawakening of a historical biblical scale. None of us has the right to look at reality the way we looked at it before October the 7th. I'm not ashamed to admit that in some very basic things, yes, absolutely, I sobered up. For example, for many years, I renounced and opposed the preached against Benjamin Netanyahu's repeated statements that we shall all live by our sword forever. Uh, that's what's uh, Jacob's blessing to Esau, uh, which became our mantra. I saw a lack of vision and futility and a denial of hope. I refused to see the simple facts. As long as our surrounding neighbours and the Arabs of the country in particular do not accept the depth of our belonging to this land and our return to it, we will be forced to hold a sword and a rifle and F-35. Generation after generation, we will continue to pass the sword from father to son as in a relay race and be ready to go to battle. For example, the recognition that there are people and organisations and movements that are an enemy, a real enemy. The one who rises up against you, you must kill as soon as you can, for his very existence endangers us. Members and activists of the Hamas movement are certainly no longer partners for potential reconciliation. They are not the sort of sort that the monotheistic religious element can bridge and connect, as my rabbi and friend Rabbi Froman believe that they were. There are others in moderate Islam who believe in the Abrahamic covenant, not Hamas. Hamas is a Malik, and I do not hesitate to say that now. We also have the responsibility to turn over every stone and strive to find a partner there, to reach out the hand as far and as bravely as possible, and to discover indeed there is a sister hand on the other side. From the experience of the last 20 years, including these very days, I know that there is, and we must make war on evil now, as so that we can strive for peace later. So he recognises that our Arab nations that you can reach out to, and they must reach out to. And so um, this is, you can see that working with Saudi Arabia and these other nations to help solve the Hamas problem is something worth pursuing. And it's interesting how now this idea of, well, we'll employ the Palestinians to work in our settlements, the government is realizing, well, we can't do that. They're not trustworthy. Uh, and we know that um, in the past uh, six months or so, when Israel has given a lot more visas to the Gazans to work in the kibbutz uh, around the border, that what they were doing were seeing where all the security things were and taking them back to Hamas so that these detailed plans could be carried out. I mean, oh, many of the ordinary Gazans uh, joined in in this uh, terrible carnage on October the 7th. And the Hamas government was appointed when Israel withdrew from Gaza in 2005. And many of the Jewish settlers there had to be 
literally carried out uh, from their lovely greenhouses and all the work that they had put in uh, and transported into Israel. And then it was handed over to the Gazans who trashed all the greenhouses. Um, and very shortly, I think the next year, there were elections which put Hamas into power and Fatah leaders who were there were brutally murdered by Hamas, such as their love of their brothers, Arabs. No love lost there. So we are at a time of change. So quickly, what does scripture lead us to conclude will be the outcome? Is this our last big wake-up call before the judgment seat? Well, clearly the master hasn't come, so we know this isn't the precursor to the Gog innovation that still lies in the future because, as I say, the judgment seat and the resurrection and gathering of the saints to Sinai takes place uh, quite a few years before the Gog invasion. So we have got time on our side, but not long. Uh, we don't know how long it will be before our master comes, but it can be very soon. And so the exhortation is we mustn't uh, put things off. Uh, time is short. We've got to look at our lives and see where we are walking. Are, are we seeking truly the kingdom of God? Are we filling our minds with the oil of the word of God? Uh, well, God's given us this wake-up call, and it's up to each one of us to respond to that. And it's certainly been a wake-up call as far as Israel is concerned. It shattered the left ideology. And I think it will be a very significant step towards an interim time of peace prior to the Gogan invasion. Uh, and I, it's difficult to see with all the uh, whole world against Israel, putting pressure upon Israel, um, how it will be. But either Israel's got to be wiped out by Hamas or Israel is successful in dealing with Hamas, and not only Hamas, but Hezbollah and the Houthis. Um, but this is what scripture tells us, and we can see, well, the great progress that was made uh, with reforms uh, and reaching out to the Arab nations, that surely that preparation is going to stand in good stead. And it fits with scripture because we know that the final invasion of Israel is at the hands of Gog, a nation that comes from the north of Israel. Uh, it tells us and it describes all its companions. And we know the first companion is Persia, Iran. So it's very really interesting that what is happening now is beginning to drop into place in preparation for this future invasion who is working uh, so strongly behind the scenes to uh, get rid of the Jews, well, it is Iran and working with Russia. And also it's so interesting to see that problems Russia has had in Ukraine has driven her to not work on her own, but to seek other companions like Iran, who are then assisting her with weaponry and uh, all that kind of thing. Uh, and so the picture in Ezekiel 38 is not of a, a Russia that acts on its own, but has many companions. Uh, and uh, those companions um, are many of the countries which are listed in the forthcoming uh, invasion nations in Ezekiel 38. But See, this is all about Gaza and what's happening in Gaza, whereas Ezekiel 38, the final invasion, is coming against Israel, dwelling on the mountains of Israel. And that's what we would call the so-called West Bank. Um, this is where the highlands are of Israel. Um, and it's clear that Israel are dwelling on the mountains of Israel at this time. So that's why the nations come against Israel, because they're occupying Palestinian territory in their eyes. And Israel has said, look, we're not going to give up territory 
if this is what our enemies do to us, we've got to hang on to territory. Look what happened in Gaza when we gave up territory. It's only brought trouble. And so we see that the nations are being prepared to come against Israel. And it's at that time that Ezekiel sees Israel dwelling with peace and safety, dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Um, we've often wondered, you know, how on earth can that be? But if Israel is successful, shows herself strong, then the moderate Arab nations have been very subdued um, uh, about what's happening in Gaza because they hate Hamas too. Uh, and they're hoping that Israel is going to be victorious. And if she is victorious with Hamas and, and has to deal with Hezbollah and the Houthis, then the moderate nations and Saudi Arabia will say, well, you know, Israel's a strong power. That's what we like. We want to work with a strong power that will defend us against Iran and all the threats that Iran is making against us. So everything points to um, Israel remaining on the so-called West Bank, what Israel calls Judea and Samaria. And at the same time, we know that there are friends of Israel, described as Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all their lions. And again, it's interesting, isn't it, that at this time, Sheba and Dedan points to the Arab nations. So we know that in this future invasion, these Arab nations are on Israel's side, working with Israel. And that's what we expect the outcome of this uh, Gaza thing to be. And it's also interesting that Britain has been foremost working uh, with Israel, using her bases, surveillance bases in Cyprus, to pass information on to Israel. She has many ships uh, stationed off Israel. She has joined the uh, coalition to attack the Houthis in the south. And the Young Lions, the foremost of which is America mm. and uh, Australia and India, uh, these are all now working and supporting Israel, all in preparation for this great change of God bringing in the Arab nations to be blessed uh, with uh, Abraham's uh, seed by Isaac, uh, who will be in the centre of the land. But the true Arab nations, descendants of Abraham through Keturah and others, uh, will be blessed in the kingdom age. They will have their part and parcel uh, in there. And so it's just so fascinating to see how it's all working out. And this is just the, the final slide almost. Um, the picture in Revelation 16 is of frog spirits gathering the nations to the battle of Armageddon. Christ returns to his household, then is the battle of Armageddon. That's the order of Revelation 16. Uh, and we can see that from Ezekiel 38, that the uh, nations of uh, Russia, the dragon, the beast, Europe, and the false prophet, the uh, Vatican, uh, correspond to the vision that uh, Daniel saw of all the nations, uh, the image of Nebuchadnezzar hasn't stood on its feet yet. Its feet are being formed at the moment. Uh, and we can see how the Babylon the Great, the Vatican, will be the head that will organise these nations to come together. Uh, Europe corresponds to the western leg and Russia to the um, eastern leg. So it is a confederation of mainly Christian countries that come against Israel, who has been even greatly reformed. It's be, the Reformation is beginning now with what's happening. Uh, there's a lot more work to be done and Elijah the prophet and others prior to the invasion of Israel will go and prepare Israel 
for this coming day of judgment when they will be defeated for the first time and in their humiliation will see that the one who has come and saved them miraculously from all their enemies, they're all dead on the mountains of Israel, who is it? It's none other than their long-rejected Messiah, and they will mourn and uh, be baptised into Christ to be in the same position as we are now. They will be brought into the bonds of the new covenant. Uh, and the Arab nations and Egypt and Assyria, uh, and then the Arab nations will all be brought into blessings of the kingdom. But Europe will resist, as we know, and many nations will perish because they will not, not accept the Lord Jesus as their king and ruler. So time is not on our side. A master can come at any time. And so what we've got to focus on is building oil in our lamps. And that oil can only come from the word of God. Uh, it is through the diligent study of God's word that we increase in the knowledge that is useful to our Heavenly Father. It's not interested in our possessions. The only thing we take to the judgment seat is our minds and how we have filled them. So don't despair. God has given us this opportunity. We must seize it, turn our lives around and focus on the things of the Spirit rather than the things of the flesh. And let us pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Thank you.